we are all in search of that work-life balance. But does it really exist or is it just life? This week's guest, Aaron Hind, who is the co-founder and president of Life Aid Beverage Company, talks about how instead of maybe searching for that balance in regard to time, it's more being intentional with the time that we do have, whether it be at work, whether it be with our friends, or whether it be at home, be very intentional with that time. And ultimately, that is much more important than the balance of time. This is the No Excuse to Miss podcast. Welcome to the No Excuse to Miss podcast. I'm your host, Scott Volkortson, and this week's guest is one I've been looking forward to for a long time. He's a former chiropractor turned co-founder and president of one of the fastest growing beverage companies out there, LifeAid. I met him back at a conference in Boulder, Colorado a few years back and kind of been following what they've been doing, what he's been doing ever since. So I'm happy to have to the show or on the show, Aaron Hind. How are you doing, Aaron? Doing well, Scott. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it. So before we kind of get started, can you just give us a quick background of, you know, I mentioned in there that you ran a chiropractic clinic and from what I understand, it was very successful, but then you just decided to kind of take a career change <laughs> or make a career change. Totally. Well, I've got about a 10 year, uh, you know, ADD issue that I work with. <laughs> so, you know, every decade or so, I, 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 you know, I'm looking for, you know, the next growth opportunity. And, uh, you know, there came a time where, you know, I had been working as a sports chiropractor for 10 years. I was, you know, seeing, you know, professional athletes, you know, a lot of political figures in our local town of Santa Cruz. And where my mindset was at the time, I had kind of peaked out. You know, I had a referral based practice, 30 new patients by referral. I felt like I had kind of peaked from an income perspective and from what I could do and how many people's lives I could affect from a health perspective. Uh, and, you know, always being entrepreneurial, you know, I really saw a need in the market. If you go back 11 years ago for, you know, clean, healthy, functional products, when the whole market was flooded with, you know, energy drinks, which nobody's drinking those for health reasons with, with, you know, soda, soda pop and, uh, and that, that is just basically liquid sugar. And then you had, you know, this kind of new wave of emerging functional brands with, with things like kombucha and, and coconut water that, you know, kind of had a health halo around them, but, you know, were kind of hippy dippy and had a very unique, different flavor profile. So I found a real need in the market to kind of take the kind of cool, sexy hip factor of the energy drinks and marry them with some real true health benefits that we saw kind of emerging on the market. And that's where life it came from. So when you got into that, it was obviously a very competitive space with all the energy drinks that had big money behind them. How did you have to kind of combat that in order to get your product recognized? You know, because back then, if we think about it, you know, I think we all know now that energy drinks for the most part are crap or a lot of them that are out there. Yeah. But back then they were still kind of being advertised as like the healthy alternative or healthy caffeine. So how did you kind of penetrate that market with a brand new product? Yeah, we went very niche, you know, and that's what I recommend to any entrepreneur, you know, go as deep as you can with your core audience. It's so easy as an entrepreneur to chase every shiny object that's out there. And a lot of times that's spreading you very thin and taking you very wide. And we went down that road initially where we were getting spread thin. We had multiple products on the market, Fit Aid, Party Aid, and Golf Raid were our first three. And so those are very different communities. You know, we were, we were putting on our polo shirts at a golf tournament and then, you know, heading up to San Francisco and putting on our Burning Man gear for Party Aid. And then we'd be running back to Santa Cruz for a CrossFit event and, you know, putting on our Lulu gear and Reeboks for, for a <laughs> CrossFit event. So, you know, we were getting spread way too thin. And it wasn't until we really focused and, and tripled down on the CrossFit community, specifically with our Fit Aid Recovery Blend. Uh, and that's when we started getting some some real traction. So the one thing I kind of noticed, and even back when I met you, and I think I asked you a lot of questions about this, was you had seemed to be very heavy, like into the ambassadors of trying to promote the brand. Was that sure. very beneficial or because it seemed like you were a little bit ahead of the curve of what a lot of people are doing now? Yeah, we, you know, we 
we were lucky enough to catch a few waves, right? We were very early to CrossFit. We're here in Santa Cruz, California, where CrossFit was founded. You know, I started doing CrossFit way in the early days. So very early to that. And that, you know, had a huge upswing. We were very early to Instagram, which, you know, 11 years ago, Instagram was, you know, doing basically what TikTok is doing now and very early to influencers. So really partnering with, you know, influential people that had large followings on Instagram to help that had an authentic connection with our brand to align and partner. Now the game has completely changed a decade later, right? Like those same tactics don't necessarily work to the degree that they used to, but you got to constantly be reinventing yourself and figuring out, okay, what's working today? Because what worked yesterday doesn't necessarily work today. And that's something we found too, is like that whole influencer game has changed. And we struggle in our industry because so much is restricted on what we can do. You know, we can't necessarily do a lot of the sponsored post or paid advertisements like most companies can. Yep. So we have to kind of find ways to work around that under the guidelines. You know, and people will say, why don't you jump to a different platform? But for us, you know, everybody's still on, you know, right now, Instagram or TikTok or whatever it might be. So we may move to that other platform, but that doesn't mean we're going to reach new audiences there. Yeah. Well, I would say for you guys, like there is an emergence of more conservative uh, platforms that are that are coming to the market. You know, whether they get adoption and traction is another thing. There's some early signs that they, they, they that are hopeful. But you figure, OK, gun owners typically, you know, a little bit more conservative of an audience. So, you know, where can you plant your flag? Where can you go that you're not going to be cancelable is, you know, I, <laughs> I, I've been studying a lot lately, like. What's it mean to be uncancelable? You know, you see all this craziness that's occurred over the last two years where people that defied the status quo. And now as we've had time and we can look back in the rearview mirror, they were actually correct, but they still were canceled and they've never been reinstated. Right. You know, yeah. This is happening in academia. It's happening in media. It's happening for, you know, basically anyone that is questioning. And I, we can talk about COVID. We could talk about, you know, Russia, Ukraine. There's a lot of different things, you know, that have happened over the last couple of years. So, you know, going deep where your audience is already at, um, going some, doing something that, you know, you're not can't you, where you're uncancelable, you know, and, uh, and finding, you know, authentic people that really get behind the product. You know, when my place burned down, you know, in 2020 and I lost, you know, my, my, basically my life's work up there on, yeah. up in Santa Cruz, there was only, I had 20 minutes to grab a few things. And one of the things I got was your gun. And the reason I, you know, that was one of the things that I got, because in my mind, like just my perceived value of that piece of equipment, my joy around shooting it, you know, the quality of the craftsmanship, like that was one of the things that made it into my car, you know. And so you have a lot of people in your community that when they experience your product, they're like, man, this thing is amazing, right? And so how do you, you know, market to and find more like-minded people that have the disposable income that appreciate, you know, firearms that find, you know, the joy in in shooting and that kind of thing and really focus and target that and don't get distracted by all the other things, right? You don't want to get distracted by people that are looking for hundred dollar 22s, or you don't want to get distracted by people that are completely, you know, anti-gun, right? You want to go to people that can afford high end and appreciate high end quality firearms. And you said something earlier where you had to focus really on like a niche market. Yep. You know, and we've kind of done that in the rim fires. And it's been tempting a lot of times. We get a lot of people ask, when are, you know, why don't we get into the larger calibers? Why don't we get into center fires? But it's one of those things we kind of know our lane. And when we stay there, and anyway, I'm not saying at some point we may not branch out into other markets, but we haven't maximized what we can do where we're at. So in totally, why would you, why would you get distracted? Like, think about all the big boys that dominate the high caliber stuff. You know, why be David versus Goliath when you could be Goliath in your own lane? You know, I don't know what the stats are. I'm sure you do, but I would imagine the 22 is the most owned gun in America. 
You know, it's typically, you know, the most approachable from, you know, any skill level. It doesn't create any kick. The, 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 the ammo tends to be the cheapest. Like that's a great market to be the top dog in. Yeah. Yeah. And right now it's, we are as busy as we've ever been. One thing I mentioned earlier is that I kind of follow, you know, what you're doing. The one thing I've always admired is like the culture that you have built at Life Aid. You know, everything from the company parties you put on with a DJ or, you know, I've seen you guys out on, you know, the boats or the yachts doing different things. Is that something that you learned from somebody else or something that you just always wanted to do as you grew your company? It's part of Orion I's just lifestyle and culture. I mean, look, you know, a lot of people talk about work life and, and personal life and, you know, and personal development, say. And I look at that and I say, well, that's total bullshit. The reason it's bullshit is because what happened, you get in a fight with your wife, you know, and you go have to go right into work. That's going to affect your work day, right? Or your boss bitches you out or whatever. You have a bad day at work or shit's hitting the fan. That's going to affect what you take home to your family. There is no work life and personal life. It's just life. You know, it's just life, right? (laughs) So, you know, creating a experience that everybody wants to be a part of that can they can get around understanding that you know it is just life and how do we create an experience for this part of life when we happen to be you know at work or behind our desk that is fun you know bringing quality people together is the number one most important thing everyone knows how you know one bad apple can just poison the whole well it's uh you know if you get someone who's scarcity mindset who, who's a gossiper, who's not pulling their own weight. You know, it's just weighs on the entire organization. So making sure you have A-tier quality individuals, taking your time to hire the right person, making sure that you're, you know, they're a right cultural fit. So bringing the quality people on board that are all motivated and aligned around what needs to get done and then creating an environment that's fun for everybody, you know. And does that mean cutting loose once in a while? Yeah, it means cutting loose once in a while. You know, we have our happy hours here. Um, you know, we, we buy lunch for everybody at least you know, one day a week. And, you know, just cr- we, we've created an outdoor space here at our HQ that so people can go out and get some sun out on the deck and look at the ocean. And, you know, we're, cl- we're only a block away from the beach. So creating the experience that, you know, it's fun to be at work, but lo- recognizing that work is just really part of life. Yeah, that's awesome, too, to think about. So like, as you guys went through COVID, I know being in California, did you have to have a lot of people then start working remotely? Or yeah, we did. To- yeah, we did. Um, I still came in and, and my business partner still came in, you know, most days of the week. Uh, but we, you know, of course, we have to be compliant with whatever the California law is, which seems to change every week. We have no <laughs> idea what we're doing in the state whatsoever. Did you lose some of that? temporarily lose some of that culture that you had worked to build yeah, we when did. everybody we did. we did it was challenging um you know you, you can only recreate so much via zoom now you know we had really worked to up the communication you know we still had our our tuesday all hands meeting where the entire company gets on a, a call which we've continued through that's never stopped um, it just went from on uh, from in person to to virtual. Half of our team was already remote, so we had the advantage of figuring out how to integrate remote workers into the culture. But one thing we did, you know, at the end of last year, is we had a, a big onboarding since we hadn't had an in person onboarding in a while. We had twenty new hires come out for that and department heads. And then we dovetailed it right into our Christmas party. And, and typically the Christmas party, everybody's invited, but, um, you know, we're not paying for travel for the out of towners to come in. If they want to come in, they, you know, they're welcome to, and we pay, we do pay for everybody's hotel room and a, you know, a nice, awesome dinner down at, at the dream Inn, which is a beautiful hotel right on the beach here. Uh, but this year we said, you know what, we haven't been able to have a retreat due to COVID restrictions. We typically have an annual retreat where we bring everybody together and have speakers and a multi-day event offsite. Um, so we did pay for everybody to fly out for the Christmas party. And I'll tell you what, it was amazing. A lot of people were hesitant, like, oh, you know, I don't want to come out just for the Christmas party, blah, blah, blah. But 100 percent of the people once, you know, the weekend and they're like, oh, I'm really I, I see why we had to do that. You know, it's just 
there's nothing like breaking bread with people or having a drink with somebody and laughing and working out with them. And, you know, it's one thing to, to know people online, but it's totally different to have that human experience. And the human experience is what it's all about. You know, what is life without that component? It's, you know, it's nothing. It's miserable. So that was that was huge to to be able to you know get people back together and now you know we're we're fairly back we're on a hybrid schedule now we're in the office three days a week and then remote too. So like how much of your guys' marketing and stuff you know I know you were big with CrossFit and all that stuff and a lot of those events were canceled. How much of your marketing do you guys still go to like I don't want to use the word trade shows but like events? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, events were a big part of our, you know, getting cans in hand strategy. I mean, we've been long-term partners in the official recovery drink of Spartan race, which I'm sure some of your community is familiar yeah. with, with Spartan, you know, where we were giving out a ice cold can of our fit aid recovery blend, right. When people needed it most, when they crossed that finish line. And that was great sampling opportunity. I mean, the bigger races, that'd be a 10,000 people over a weekend and that was shut down basically for two years. So yeah, that was really challenging for us to um, to wh where we kind of shined in the experiential part of marketing was shut down. And, and you lose, like you said before, even with your your own team, that whole face to face interaction or connection. Yeah, which is is impossible to replace. You know, that's the one thing I missed about us not doing trade shows is they've obviously changed over the last twenty five years. But you still, like you said, no matter how many Zoom calls you do, no matter how many, you know, how much technology is improved until you can sit down and have a drink with somebody or have coffee with them, whatever it might be. There, there's no way to replace that. There isn't. And fortunately, trade shows are now, you know, coming back. Events are coming back. We just did, uh, you know, Expo, Natural Products Expo West, which is kind of the Super Bowl for consumer packaged goods that just happened a couple weeks ago down in, in Anaheim. You know, we got the Spartan events going again, CrossFit events going again. So, you know, I'm optimistic uh, about it. I think, you know, uh, we can thank uh, Putin for ending COVID here in the country. <laughs> that is definitely true. Now, if we could just start flying without a mask, we'd really have something. Yeah, really. Tell me about it. Yeah, I, I, I think most people are forgetting that. Like, oh, crap. What did I do with all my masks? You know, it's it's funny just watching week over week changes. The day that the mask mandate dropped here in, in Santa Cruz County, you know, I was one of like two people not wearing masks inside the grocery <laughs> store. And then each week, you know, it's it, the adoptions. You know, now we're probably 50 50 if, throughout the grocery store. <laughs> One question I have, and I think you maybe already answered it or alluded to it a little bit, is it looks like you mentioned like they talk about work-life balance and all that, but it looks like that's something that you do very well as far as taking time to be on vacation with your family. You know, and so many people, I think, in the entrepreneurial space feel like they have to hustle and grind 24-7. Yeah. But it looks like you've been able to create a very successful business and do what has to be done there. But at the same time, not lose sight of that time with family, you know, taking vacations, going to have fun. And I was just going to say, does that just go back to your idea of it's just life? There's no totally. you know, separation between yeah. them. Yeah, it, it really does. And, you know, the hustle and grind never stops. I mean, I'm grinding at this particular moment in time harder than I ever have at, at work. So, and, and when I'm on vacation, I'm still typically, you know, working. What I'm doing is con <laughs> just consolidating the time that I need to be in front of the computer or, or on meetings to say an hour or two in, instead of eight to 10. Right. So, you know, it never stops. Uh, and that's okay. You know, what I'm really working towards, and it's always a work in progress, is, is you know, being intentional. So, you know, if I'm out, you know, uh, on the beach with the kids, I'm on the beach with the kids, you know, or if I'm having dinner, I'm having dinner. And, you know, but if I'm in front of the computer and in a meeting, I need to be in front of the computer and in the meeting getting it done. So being very focused, intentional, you know, with the time that I have, because what I've realized, especially with family and kids and you know, being an entrepreneur, so many of us. Uh, really look for, you know, again, this kind of work-life balance, quote unquote, and we look at it from a time perspective. 
like, oh my gosh, I'm spending, you know, 10 hours a day at work and, and weekends. So I need this like equal amount to balance out this, this supposed ratio that's in our mind with the kids or, or with my wife or whatever. And that's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Right. It's always yeah. going to be 10 to one or 15 to one, but that's okay. Is what I realized. It doesn't need to be balanced from a straight time perspective where you need, where we screw up is we're, we're unintentional about the time that we have. So, you know, I think that my wife and kids would rather have me completely present and focused for five minutes than just kind of there physically, but mostly checking my phone and answering emails and jumping on and off calls and stuff for two hours. Right. Um, yeah. So the intent behind the time that we have re recognizing it'll never be balanced from just a straight time perspective, as long as you're, you know, working in and on your business. And that's something that I still have to work at. And I've learned to get better is when I'm doing something with my family, be doing it with the family, not, you know, checking emails or emotionally or mentally detached. Cause I'm trying to think of a problem at work or whatever it might be. And over the years I've learned if I can give 15 to 30 minutes with my, you know, when my kids were a little bit younger, that's all they really want. And then they're ready to go do their own thing anyway. Right. Totally. You know, if they, they have only to spend an hour with me, it's like torture anyway. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And the, and the challenge with the, you know, former way of doing things where you're, you know, constantly distracted is what happens is there's a whole layer of guilt that forms. So when you're at work and you should be focused on work, you're actually thinking about how you're screwed up at home. And so you're distracted from what needs to get done at work by, your, your lack of performance at home. And then when you're at home, you're thinking about work and, you know, you're screwing up on both sides of it. So it's much better to just be very intentional, you know, for that defined amount of time. And then, you know, then get back to what you got to get done at work. Yeah, completely agree with that. And something else I've always noticed is like, you have a very like interesting perspective on different things and very like insightful when it comes to I'll just say life in general. Is that something that you continually work on or something you've always had? You know, have, have you always? Yeah, continual like, work. <laughs> continual okay. work. Yeah. As my wife will, will tell you, I'm a work in progress. <laughs> um, yeah, she said, uh, I, I'll tell you a little story. She said to me, uh, you know, I got married. She was older than me, eight years older than me. So I was uh, 27, I believe. And she said, uh, you know, right when we were getting married, she, she says, you know, when you're 35, honey, you're going to be perfect. <laughs> yeah, I am late twenties. I'm like, I don't know how to take that one, but I'm like, okay, good. I got something to look forward to. And then she, you know, here comes my 35th birthday and she has this, you know, we have this big party and everything and all our friends over, she takes me aside and she goes, Remember when I told you uh, when you're 35, you know, it's good. You're going to be perfect. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She goes, I meant 40. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm 46 now. I'm still working on it. So, you know, I mean, that's the way life is, right? You got to, you know, my, my priest told me one time, he said, you know, life is like a salmon swimming upstream, right, to, to the spawning grounds. You're like, if you stop putting in the effort, if you stop moving, the current's going to just take you right back out to the ocean. Like there is no, you know, stagnation is death, right? We you know, talked about yeah. it a little bit earlier, but if you're not constantly progressing, you're constantly moving. And it's really interesting if you look at it from a micro or macro perspective, right? If you look at biology, you know, the biggest sign of life, like inside the cell is that things are moving around, you know, like a sign of death is stagnation. You look, take a, a, a pool of water and have no movement, give it time, you know, it gets rancid. Like lack of movement is death. So we constantly need to be improving. We constantly need to be moving forward. And a lot of times if we have to take steps back to actually move forward. We look at things that happen in our lives and our perspective needs to really shift to things are happening to us. I'm sorry, things are happening for us, not to us, meaning we're not uh, we're not subjective. We're not a victim to life, but life is actually conspiring on our behalf, even through the most challenging things like, you know, I've had massive challenges in my life over the last 
25 years and I and one of the biggest shifts that I've made is really approaching and looking at things like okay this is there's a lesson here there's growth on the other side of this obstacle you know bring it on it may not be fun I might not be happy about it you know but breathe you're not a victim you know you you're you have a choice on how you react to this situation it's not you know, it's not cause and effect like we were taught when we were kids, right? Everything's about cause and effect. No, no, it's cause plus reaction equals effect. How we react is the variable, you know? Things are happening all the time. Shitty things happen, but how we react to them determines the outcome, not just the fact that they happened. And how difficult was that when you lost your uh, lost your uh, place in the fire to kind of have that perspective? Yeah, I mean, it's challenging, but it's look, it's easy to have certain dogmas of, of life and have, you know, this outlook and, you know, that's just like, oh yeah, this is what I believe and never have it challenged. Cause then it's like, well, do you really believe that? Or is that just some bullshit that you spout off on podcasts? Right. So it's not until the obstacle is actually right in front of you, you go, okay, this sucks. You know, <laughs> this is a massive obstacle. But do I believe my own bullshit or not? And if I truly do, then I got to say, okay, where is the lesson in this? Where is the opportunity? And specifically looking at like, you know, the property burning down. It's like, okay, that's, you know, 18 years of my life, blood, sweat, and tears, you know, put into this property. I'm heavily underinsured. So it's a massive, you know, financial hit. I no longer have the security of living off the grid and having my own solar, and my own well, and, you know, basically being self-sufficient in case shit hits the fan. Like, you know, I'm not a prepper, but I, you know, lived in a, yeah. in, in an environment where external forces literally didn't affect me. Like when people would be like, oh my God, the power went out or this happened on the news or whatever. I'm like, I don't care. Like, it's not that I don't <laughs> care, but I, you know, it doesn't affect me personally. And I don't, you know, I'm not going to allow it to occupy space in my consciousness or, or worry, so to speak. Right. You know, so when all that goes away, you, know, you got to look at it and go, okay, you know, what, what is the lesson here? And the lesson for me now that, you know, some time has gone by and I've, I've had a chance to reflect on it is like, we assume that there's permanence in life, right? Like, you, you know, you buy a house or you buy some land and, you know, you build, you build things, you, you lay bricks, you know, you put in retaining walls, you know, you, you assume that those are permanent because, you know, you can't ever foresee anything happening to those things in your lifetime or your kid's lifetime. It's like, okay, I'm building this family compound. The kids won't have to go in debt to buy a house because now we all have our own place to live. It'll be multiple generations will live here. I'll be an old great grandpa, you know, on the, on my rocking chair, uh, shooting my, well, courts in uh, 22 <laughs> and uh, off the deck and grandkids will be running around, right? That's a fallacy, though, because by definition, all material things have a beginning and an end. All material things. And it may not have been in my lifetime or my kid's lifetime or their kid's lifetime, but eventually it all burns. Eventually it all crumbles. Eventually it, it you know, look at throughout history, you know, we're still uncovering, you know, buried pyramids or or, you know, the empires that have been covered by the ocean or covered, you know, underneath thousands of years of erosion and, and dirt and debris and sand, like it all crumbles eventually. And as soon as we get that through our head, it adds a whole different perspective on life. Like the material stuff, it all comes and goes. So, you know, why sweat it? Was I attached to a lot of the things I lost, my boat and my motorcycles and all that? Yes, I was very attached to it. It was very <laughs> difficult to to lose those things. I had real joy in using those things, but at the end of the day, they're all material. And then what's the opposite of that? You know, the other lesson that was learned is like, there's things that, you know, a, a lot of people discount in life as inconsequential that actually are permanent, that are permanent. And I'll give you the, the, uh, the one that most people don't want to hear. I don't even want to face myself. Like think about our thoughts you know, our thoughts. It's one thing to like be in alignment with the words that come out of your mouth and your actions and, you know, to be a good husband and father and business owner and, and, you know, be a, a good citizen and all of that and act accordingly. And that's what we should all be doing. Absolutely. But just think about our thoughts, you know, 
our thoughts have permanence. Once you think something, you can't unthink it, right? And like, are you truly thinking in alignment with, you know, your personal self and how you should be showing up in the world, let alone the words that come out of your mouth? You know, if we talk disparagingly about people or, or, you know, speak in, in, you know, in scarcity terms, like we can't unspeak something. You can't unthink something. You can't unspeak something. You sure as heck can't unact something. You can't undo something once you've taken action on it. You know, you could try to take corrective action, but you can't undo the original thing. Like these are the things that have permanence in the universe. There's real energy behind our thoughts. There's real energy behind our words and our actions that are put out into the universe and can never be retracted. So here we're all, you know, grinding away and and thinking, okay, I'm going to, you know, build generational wealth or I'm going to do this. I'm going to create all these permanent things. I'm going to put this library with my name on it. It's all total bullshit because it all crumbles. But what we really need to tune into is what we're putting out in the universe from in our mind, in our, in our words and our actions and guarding the mind from the inputs too. I mean, you know, the news, it's interesting if you look at the evolution of the quote unquote news, you know, since we were kids or even our parents' generation, the news used to tell us what to think about, right? It was like, oh, this happened in the world and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the news source is supposed to be very, you know, objective in the reporting. And then we have conversation. Okay, this is happening in the world and this is what we're going to talk about. But now it's shifted to tell us what to think, not to what to think about, but what to think. So I don't care if you're, you know, listening to, to Fox News or CNN and CNBC. It's basically the same speak, Come one coming from the far right and one coming from the far left. And they're all telling you what to think about. And that's a dangerous slope. They're hijack. You're allowing news sources, quote unquote, news sources, basically media companies that are motivated by one thing and one thing only is to make money to hijack your mind and tell you what to think about. And then think about what the repetitive thoughts in your mind are if you're letting your, your your thoughts be hijacked by external forces and then the words that come out of your mouth and you know how you're taking action. It's very, very scary. And we've seen it play out to a significant degree in the last couple of years, both on the, you know, again, on the far right and far left. I want my kids to be independent thinkers, regardless of whether they agree with me or not. Let's have a conversation and a debate about it and respect yes. each other's opinion and use deductive reasoning, you know, and create a real skill set here, not be a puppet master for, you know, for some ideology that's motivated by making more money. Well, and I think we see that so often too, you know, people no longer want to think for themselves. It's much easier just to repeat what somebody has told them to think. Totally. And then you just see, and then if you ever challenge them or ask them about it, they have a very hard time articulating why they think that way other than I saw that here or I read that here. Yeah. It's much easier to hit the cancel button, right? Yeah. God forbid you challenge, you know, I look at some of the, you know, what I consider some of the greatest thinkers of our time. Like, you know, look at, um, for, for a real person that that's a conversationalist and, and asks right questions. Look at Joe Rogan, you know, it's easy to, yeah. you know, for, you know, quote unquote, mainstream media to cancel him or discount him. But I was like, well, he's actually asking the right questions and having, you know, engaging in conversation. Look at like Jordan Peterson out of Canada. You know, I mean, it's like he's one of the greatest thought leaders of our time. Like if you actually listen to him and listen to him debate anybody that wants to debate him, like who who's better at laying out an argument than, than him? Like, you know, those are the type of people I want my kids listening to, like, you know, just listen to how they interact and how they question the status quo. And, uh, you know, you'll see what real free thinking looks like. Yeah. And now you see, it. you know, obviously everybody's heard about Rogan being canceled, but now even like they want to cancel Jordan Peterson and discredit everything that he says or does. Yeah, they try. But I think, you know, the real free thinkers out there that actually listen to it before they're making an opinion on it go, well, the guy makes actually a lot of a lot of good points. And I might not agree with them on 100 percent of things, but his arguments are very sound. You know? Yeah, he's he's put thought behind something he says and doesn't just spout off at the mouth with his first reaction. 
And he realizes that everything he says is put under a microscope. So he's very thoughtful about what he says. And that's one thing I've learned from him is like, wow, really articulate in your mind before you speak, right? Because what you say can be used against you and it's being used against people all the time right now. So really be thoughtful and articulate before you open your mouth. And he does that better than anyone. Yeah. And his book was one of those that I recommend to everybody. Yeah. Totally. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. The 12 rules of of life. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's excellent. So I guess back to learning all this, when you decided to go from chiropractor to open your business, was there, did you meet a lot of resistance from like your wife or family or friends? Like, why are you giving up what, what to society would seem to so many as a successful well, it was a successful practice, but you were thinking bigger than that. Well, no, that's a good question. And and fundamentally, I don't know that it's possible to be an entrepreneur and, and do what we do without the support of your significant other, whether that's your, you know, your wife or, you know, uh, you know, long living girlfriend or whatever, like I can imagine because, because it's so challenging because there's so many many failures along the way there, and there's, there's so much time that has to go into it and, and, uh, and effort and dedication. I can't imagine, you know, coming home and getting bitched at for my decision every day, which she could have easily done. <laughs> <Multiple>, you know, <laughs> when we're eating mac and cheese and, and tuna every night for, for dinner and living in a 400 square foot RV with, with two kids, it would be very easy for my wife to be like, what did you do? What did you get us into here? But she didn't, she's always been, you know, very supportive. She even still to this day when I'm, you know, allow, allowing things to get the best of me and feeling, you know, overwhelmed. She's always been, you know, the rock that's been there and said, honey, it's going to be okay. It's going to work out. It always has worked out. Look at the history. Like, why do you think it's going to be any different? I'm like, you know what? You're right. It always has worked out. What am I worried about? You know? So having that type of support system is, is key. And I don't know that it's possible without it. And the one thing that I always give my wife credit for, and I assume it's very much similar to you is, you know, they have to be there but they never get any of the credit, you know, as business owners, writer, it's kind of like the quarterback of a football team. They get all the blame and all the credit. Yeah. You know, so my wife and like in my case has to work behind the scenes and we've had some of those things where things have happened. And I'd had to say, just trust me. I, I I, trust me. I, you know, it's in my gut. I know this is going to work out. And they have to have a lot of blind faith because she didn't necessarily see the vision that we had. Mm-hmm. You know, she was just looking at the immediate issues or financial problems that we had. Mm-hmm. Sure. <laughs> and that's all she could see. You know, so I always give her a lot of credit for standing by me and believing in what we were trying to do. Yeah, I mean, having faith, uh, you know, that you know, that whoever is making the decisions is steering the ship in in the right direction and being a sounding board is always good and and making sure, you know, like even with, with my business partner, you know, we've got similar skill sets, but we also have very different skill sets and we have different way of looking at things. And, you know, I had never had in my kind of previous side hustle, so to speak, and little entrepreneurial ventures, you know, one that that has had this level of success. And, you know, he's a big part of that because he brings a perspective, you know, that, that I hadn't had, like, for instance, you know, I'm like full gas all the time, like go, go, go. And the, as you know, a hundred things need to line up and be, you know, perfectly in order to see success in business. And one of those things or two of those things could completely sink the entire ship. Well, I would never account for those one or two things, and those would all you know, those would always come back to bite me, right? Um, and now that I've really studied successful people and looked at this, it's like, what's the number one rule? Is always protect the downside, and, and that was never part of my thought process, and you know, it was never part of my vocabulary vernacular. But and now it is. I've realized the hard way after you know, <laughs> losing it all a couple times now. Yeah. 
that uh, that you know protecting the downside is, is probably a smart thing to do. Not probably, it is a smart thing to do. So, where do you guys see Life Aid going? I, I know that in the past you've said that you've had offers, or at least I've read that you had offers to possibly sell the company, or you know, it's like a bigger conglomerate. But at the time, it was important to you to keep it under your guys's management. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we are heads down, focused on execution, focused on people exchanging their, you know, their unhealthy drink ha- habits or their what they perceive as healthy for actually clean ingredients. I mean, you know, you look at, say, the energy drink market, we had energy 1.0, which everyone knows the big three, you know, that kind of launched the energy drink market. No one thinks of those as healthy drinks. Then we've had the emergence of energy 2.0 this performance energy drink category that's really crushing right now. The numbers are through the roof and they have a perceived health halo around them. And they brought a lot of women into the marketplace that are drinking these newer energy drinks, but they still have the same old tactics, the same old BS. And if you actually turn around the can and look at it, they're artificially sweetened with sucralose or aspartame, even though on the front, they may say naturally flavored, you know, so it looks like it's a natural product, but it's not. Or they're playing the two servings per container BS when everyone knows you drink the whole thing in one sitting or they're full of, you know, sodium, which we already have too much sodium in our diet in the, in America anyway. So I'm really excited about, you know, what I just call energy 3.0. You know, forever we've had all of our vitamin blends, which have done you know really well from Fit Aid and in the, as a recovery drink to Focus Aid as the first nootropic drink on the market you know, party aid for weekend recovery, recovery, immunity aid, et cetera. But, um, you know, we are, you know, launching the truly clean, a truly clean energy drink to meet, you know, our consumers, what they've been asking for for many years, where we take the fit aid recovery blend that people know and love. We're putting 200 milligrams of clean caffeine in it with green tea leaf extract. And we're keeping the calorie count super low at 15 using all natural sweeteners, et cetera. So, Really excited to be able to provide people what they've been looking for for a long time, but doing it in a really responsible, clean way with with the launch of Fit Aid Energy, which is coming up here in another uh, a couple weeks. I can't wait for that. That'll be awesome. Yeah, like excited. you said, you know, if you turn around the can, you look at so many of the ingredients, and then you spend some time on the internet and research them, or even you know, ask people that are in the know. So many of those ingredients, you know, it's not that much different from you know, like drinking a soda pop or something like that. Exactly. People turn, you know, if you're drinking an energy drink, turn around that can, educate yourself on the ingredients. Sucralose kills your gut microbiome. There's you know, multiple studies on PubMed now that support that. You know, these red and blue and yellow dyes, they're, they're toxic. You know, they, they're carcinogens. You know, high sugar drinks are, are causing diabetes you know, that the diabetes rates have not gone down in this country and it's due to sugary beverages period and like education isn't, isn't there an ingredient that when combined with caffeine that are in a lot of them yeah the, you know there's some things around taurine and you know yeah, taurine, that's, that's yeah. what i was thinking of and, you know taurine as a standalone ingredient you know maybe it's okay when they combine it with caffeine there's some question marks there but most energy drink companies use taurine as a filler you know, just to look like it has a bunch of stuff in it and use it as a filler ingredient. It's extremely inexpensive. It's used as a filler. And a lot of them are using um, synthetic caffeine. Synthetic caffeine is derived from urea. You know, like, <laughs> I think if people knew that, they'd be like, hmm, maybe I should check my caffeine source here. Yeah, that's crazy. So one last question that I, and I like to ask all of our guests this is, I always feel like behind every successful person that at some point in their life, they had a pivot. I call it a pivot point, but like a significant event that whether it was good or bad at the time kind of is largely in part responsible for where they are now. Can you think of anything like that? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I would reframe the whole good or bad thing because I don't know that there is good or bad, right? It's, Things are happening and how we react to them determines the outcome. Um, Some of the worst things in my mind at the time ended up being the exact thing that I needed in order to move forward. So for me, it was, you know, um, going through a bankruptcy in 2000 
in nine, I, I, you know, I see in 2007, I'm looking around and all my friends from high school are making 15 bucks an hour are paper millionaires from real estate. So I go all in on multiple spec homes, sight unseen, by the way, uh, in, in 2007. Well, we all want know what happened later that year and into 2008 is the housing market completely collapsed. So here I am, you know, generating a ton of revenue. I'm making, you know, on some months, $50,000 a month as a solopreneur I'm bringing in, but I got 70 going out the door trying to support, you know, building these spec homes and, and eventually just completely ran out of money and was fully in debt. And, uh, and it was the lowest point in my life. You know, it was, you know, I'm looking in the mirror here. I'm in my early thirties, supposed to be in my prime. And, you know, I find myself in the situation that I put myself in and as a complete failure and really just had a long time to self-reflect and go, okay, I made a series of decisions to get me here. I can make a series of decisions to get me out. And that's where I really started changing my trajectory, starting practicing a daily morning routine, you know, really focused on uh, gratitude practice and, you know, meditation and breathing and, and consistent with exercise and just everything that I have carried forward for the last, you know, over a decade now was all a result of, you know, that pivotal moment. And I'm sure it's evolved, but you still stick to a pretty or to a routine every morning. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it, it has to do with keto coffee, Wim Hof breathing, uh, yoga, um, some, you know, meditation, morning prayer, you know, um, some exercise. So, um, yeah, uh, cold plunge. I've got uh, my morning routines pretty dialed. Mine's pretty dialed and I really need to step up to the cold plunge, but it's. Well, even if you don't have a plunge, cause I don't have one, you know, um, again, you know, everything burned down, but what I do <laughs> is, uh, you know, just right at the end of my shower, I'll do like a 10 rep Wim Hof and then I'll just slam the hot water off and just let the cold go for about a minute. And that's, a, that's a good way. To, <laughs> <laughs> I need to start creative. doing that. Yeah. Just do it. And it's amazing. And the big thing there is, you know, being able to control your breath. So many people, when they get exposed to cold, they just react and they react in like a <gasps> panicky way and lose their breath and freak out. Like just being able to control that allows you to control a lot of other circumstances in your life. When you would just react uh, hysterically, you can be a little bit more level headed around things. I need to do that. So where can people find you? I mean, it's lifeaid.com. Is that right? Yeah. Lifeaid Bevco, B-E-V-C-O.com. Okay. You know, most active, we're most active on you know Instagram and now TikTok, FitAid, at FitAid, F-I-T-A-I-D is our, our most active. And then for me personally, it's just my name on everything. Aaron, A-A-Ron, Hind, H-I-N-D-E on Instagram, LinkedIn, et cetera. Okay. Well, I appreciate this. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for taking the time again. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Thank you guys for listening. And as always, if you have any questions, hit us up at podcast at Thank you.